is In the Garden on KSQD Santa Cruz, K-Squid 90.7 FM. And we're talking with Martin Quigley, the executive director of the UCSC Arboretum. Welcome, Martin. Good morning, Joe. It's a pleasure to be here. We're going to talk this morning about a Mediterranean climate. I think it's important for us to start the program with a definition of what that is. Right. We're really going to talk about what we do going into the next season. And in order to set that um, discussion on the right track, I'd like to remind everybody that the idea of the four seasons that most of us who grew up anywhere else in North America grew up with do not really apply here in the Mediterranean climate of the central coast of California. For one thing, our temperature differentials are not that great compared to uh, places with a true winter, that is, uh, months of nighttime of freezing temperatures. Most plants going into complete dormancy, at least least above ground uh, until next spring. So uh, the idea of fall preparation and getting ready for uh, winter is very, very different here. Now, a Mediterranean climate is unique in that it only exists in five places around the world, two in the northern hemisphere and three in the southern hemisphere. And those five places are here in the central coast of California, roughly from the Bay Area to about Santa Barbara, the western part of the actual Mediterranean basin, Portugal, uh, Spain, um, a little bit of Italy, and uh, north, northwestern Africa, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia. And then in the southern hemisphere, the central coast of Chile, very similar to here, and the western cape of South Africa, and the southwestern on uh, part of the southwest coast of Australia, so just five places. What defines the Mediterranean climate is being between 40 and 30 degrees north or south of the equator, which means we have shortening days in the winter season, lengthening mm -hmm. days in the summer, relatively cold ocean temperatures, and a hot continental land mass. And that gives rise to summer fogs. So summer fogs are also a characteristic of the Mediterranean climate. Um, not all of them have the same amount of fog, just as not everybody has as long a dry season as Central California does. Uh, however, there's a very distinct season with no rain at all. So when we prepare for the change of the seasons. It's not going from super hot to super cold. It's going from relatively hot to relatively cooler, but going mostly from dry to wet. And so we have to prepare for a rainy season. At the Arboretum, we feature plants from around the world from these various um, other Mediterranean climate zones. And many of them are particularly adapted to what happens here. One caveat is that our Californian dry season tends to be longer than the dry season in the other Mediterranean zones. We can go up to six months with really no rain, even though we do have heavy condensing fogs. Mm -hmm. um, South Africa, for instance, may have a dry season that really only lasts um, four to five months. We have to think differently about our gardens. Our calendars are not set by freezing temperatures in October, um, sitting by the fire with seed catalogs in November, <laughs> planting our bulbs out uh, for the winter. Um, you can still look at those catalogs. Uh, yeah, you can look at the catalogs. And, and keep in mind, though, what, what you're bringing those plants to um, is maybe different from where they evolved and, and where they perform best. On the other hand, that being said, this is one of the best places to garden in the continent. And Mediterranean climates are the zones where you can grow more plants from different areas than any other climate zone. So here, right along the central coast, we have everything from alpines to tropicals growing in the same small area. A friend of mine up in Mill Valley um, had alpine rock gardens and on one side of the house and bananas and pineapples on the <laughs> other side of the house. So it's possible to do a great many, many plant varieties that you couldn't do anywhere else, but you have to follow some I wouldn't say rules. You have to follow some intuition about what is going to thrive here. And especially if you're interested in conserving water or having less maintenance, you need to realize that uh, there are many, many plants that once established will not require supplemental irrigation, except if the dry season goes on too long or if right here we have a couple days at 100 degrees, you might be dragging a hose out. But it is possible here to garden with this climate recognizing that it is different, unless you grew up here, it's different from anything else you've experienced.
Uh, we tend to think of fall color as a universal phenomenon, and we do have fall color here. Mm -hmm. And even that is a little bit crazy. If you look at sweet gums or liquid ambar, and they're planted all around Santa Cruz and up and down the coast, they're good tidy street trees. They have fall color. Some of them start turning red in July. Mm -hmm. Some of them don't start turning red until November. Some of them will stay red for months at a time, not like New England where you get six mm -hmm. weeks of the cold and then everything falls off. So the same species in different varieties can, can give you a spectacular seasonal display, but it's not something you could look at your calendar like you could in Vermont and say, okay, maples will be turning next week. It's, you know, the nights are getting colder. You know, we've had uh, people on uh, talking about irises, and the iris, the bearded iris, mm -hmm. seems to be doing very well here. But there are other real challenges, and, and I've known some people who love tulips who, you know, had a special refrigerator put into their garage just to keep them cold. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but tulips, um, even if you do manage to get them past the uh, the vermin, the moles, <laughs> the... yeah. The squirrels, the gophers, even if they survive that, um, they're just not adapted to having a very mild winter with no freezing. Now, that's not true of all bulbs, but tulips in particular, which um, um, evolved in higher, uh, higher latitudes and higher altitudes, usually need a cold winter, a couple of months with freezing night temperatures because they're putting out roots very slowly all winter. Then when spring comes and it warms up, they're... Um, they're ready to pop those buds out of the ground. Here, even if you chill the bulbs, and it's, it's a lot of extra work to have that extra refrigerator full of pots of bulbs, yeah. even if you do that and then put them in, often when it does uh, come to putting them out, they'll, they'll just shoot up and bloom if you're lucky, and then the bulbs won't come back. Now, in the east, or in more temperate climates, those tulips can last for years and years. They can split, and they can, they can reproduce. That's true of some of the daffodils as well. The King Alfreds, those big, big cup hybrids, look great, but they need a winter climate. However, the small, the narcissus um, with the, um, the pheasant's eye, for instance, a lot of those, again, are adapted to more of a Mediterranean climate. Those will persist and even naturalize in the landscape here. Yeah, I have also had good luck with some of the miniature daffodils, like Gata Tet and Jack Snipe. And, and the those, miniature ones, too. They, they come from the Mediterranean. Well. Yeah, right? they do very well. In uh, Spain and Portugal, you see them growing out of... Um, stone walls and, yeah. and between paving stones that they, they wow. just they just spread everywhere hardy cyclamens for instance um hardy cyclamens are again are a true mediterranean plant from the mediterranean mm -hmm. and they're blooming now yeah um yeah. so that's another thing in in a more temperate uh non-mediterranean place things stop blooming now it gets warm it gets dry the plants are stressed their systems are preparing to shut down for winter time they're not thinking about making flowers until next year but here we have species popping into bloom this week mm -hmm. um, like the cassias those spectacular yellow street trees that are really subtropical but they do great in this climate um, some of the myrtaceous things um, especially the eucalyptus genus the carimbias are now starting to bloom mm -hmm. and uh that's unheard of in the middle of September for most of the country. So one of the things you should always keep in the forefront of your mind is you can garden year-round. Here in Santa Cruz in the Central Coast, there are flowers year-round. So we don't have a winter time when you just take off from gardening. You know, you mulch your beds and, and shut the door before Thanksgiving, and then you go back out again in March when things start to grow again. Things are, are here tuned to the rainy season. So when the rains start in October, lots of buds start to swell. All those South African bulbs that have been underground put up some leaves, and some of those things are still blooming now. You know, the, the, uh, the bulbs that have this alternate growth pattern where they put out the foliage in the rainy season, that dies down in early summer, and by mid or late summer, like now, the naked ladies pop up, and the mm -hmm. Brunsvigias, and all sorts of incredible bulbs, but they are adapted to fire in a Mediterranean climate. They're not adapted to cold winters and and wet springs of mm -hmm. a temperate climate. This is In the Garden on KSQD Santa Cruz K-Squid 90.7 FM and we're talking with the Martin Quigley, the Executive Director of the UCSC Arboretum. So tell us a little bit more about things to avoid in your garden. What might not do well for you? 
things to avoid that are still sold around here, and that partially is the fault of the big box stores that are mm -hmm. getting in massive amounts of plants that may have been grown in Oregon or Tennessee or Southern California. Things to avoid especially are blooming shrubs and trees that need a winter to perform well, a cold, hard winter. Lilacs will grow here, but lilacs are never as spectacular mm -hmm. as they are in a place like Wyoming, where they have a couple of really, really hard winter months. Some of the fruit trees are more temperate. I was very surprised when I came here and saw all the apple orchards in Watsonville. So, I mean, we do get wonderful plums and apricots here. But one of the other things to remember that winters where they have freezing temperature also take down a lot of the pests. And so if you grow in California, mm. even here along the um, the central coast where it does get cool, if not freezing much of the time. Those things that have parasites don't shed them. One of the advantages of a plant to go deciduous is not just to protect its tissues during cold, but it gets rid of any parasites or diseases that or insects, for instance, that have taken hold mm -hmm. during the warm months and they can start fresh in the spring. Here, where things can be growing year-round, uh, when you get diseases and pests, they can persist and, and it's a lot more difficult to deal with them. So are you setting yourself up for more work if you try to push the envelope a little bit too far. Now there are things though that you do in the fall here that you would do in the fall anywhere and one of them is tackling uh, major pruning. The general rule of thumb for pruning flowering shrubs is to do it after this year's bloom. Um, so that it will be able to grow a little bit more uh -huh. and set buds to come again next spring. Here, the buds are going to start swelling when the rains start. So you want to make sure that you've done all your winter pruning probably by October and not as you could in the east, for instance. People are out there pruning in December and January because the plants are much more dormant uh -huh. and they're not really feeling it. For pruning anything, there, there are reasons to prune, whether it's for size, for shape, for floral display, for fruit, especially fruit trees. You want to have a good structure for your tree so in a good year your branches don't break under the load. But you also want to think about how they ripen. So apples and, and in fact, um, almost all fruit trees should not have a lollipop top that's a round globe, uh, the tree structure should more resemble a broken umbrella in which you have four or five main stems radiating out and that the center of the tree it still gets direct sunlight so you have uh -huh. evenly ripening fruit. So structural pruning is really, really important. So why, why do you prune? You prune for shape, size, health, and display. And then you want to remove anything, what does Brett Hall say? Dead, diseased, something and deranged no, yeah right <laughs> <laughs> so um and when the leaves fall off shrubs it's very very easy to see the structure and to work on it things that are evergreen and we have so many ever mm -hmm. evergreen things around here you really have to part the branches with your hands and stick your head in there and see where branches are crossing or rubbing where you've got a lot of suckering coming almost all the uh woody fruit trees are uh, grafted and this is a really important thing to keep an eye on that the base the um the rootstock is generally a wild species that is very, very vigorous, although it, it may have, you know, kind of mediocre fruit. The scion or the graft on top of that rootstock is bred specifically for good fruit qualities, and it might not by itself on its own root, it might not be very vigorous. And so almost all fruits are grafted from grapevines to apples to citrus. That rootstock is alive too, and because it's so vigorous, it often starts to send mm -hmm. up suckers. And so you go out and look at your plum tree, and all of a sudden, even if the plum is purple leafed, you have this incredible shrub of green leaves coming up from uh, the root. The bottom, That's yeah. from the rootstock. Yeah. And if you neglect those, they can actually swamp the, the graft above it and uh -huh. take over and pretty uh -huh. soon the the graft just kind of gives up and the uh, the wild rootstock takes over where do you recommend the ground level be if you know you're looking at the graft you can easily see the, mm -hmm. the circle of the graft mm -hmm. should that be under the soil line just above it or no. sitting on top of it or no the the graft definitely should be above the soil line remember that's still part of the stem one of the things that um, you need to watch out for things, especially um, cherries of all sorts and, and some of the apples, is that um, they will make a mat of suckers. You need to keep the, the suckering down to the ground and just keep after it year after year. But you don't want to plant those things too deep. If you plant them too deep, um, the graft might fail eventually, um, disease and, and rot can set in because that is scar tissue. 
Uh, remember that plants don't replace tissue. This is something people think that, that trunks heal themselves. Well, they don't, like when we get a cut, our body takes away the dead cells and puts new ones in there. But a plant doesn't take away the dead cells. They dry up and the plant seals them off. And this is why you get knots in wood. And when you wound a trunk, the bark from the edges might eventually grow over it. But it's not healed inside. There's a void in there that could rot. Um, that's often the beginning of tree failures when a, a poorly healed wound still has some decaying matter in, inside of it. So remember that trees, if there's a part in trouble, and if it's not going to ruin the effect, it's better to cut it off and not to expect the tree to regenerate tissue in a way that it, it simply can't do. In general, it's good to keep your graft union between the rootstock and the scion. It's, it's good to keep it in open air. The better air circulation you can have underneath the shrub or around the tree, the less likely bacteria and fungi are to be able to colonize in, inside the uh, bark lining. One of the things that's my favorite time of year, and this is a fall activity for the Central Coast, is to divide your succulents and move them around. Remember when you, when you take a succulent part, a stem, a root, a leaf, many of them will make new plants, but almost all of them need to dry out first. If you stick them right in the ground and water them, that exposed cell tissue is going to rot. So you lay them out on a flat, on a shelf, somewhere not in the blazing sun, and let them dry for a couple of weeks until, again, it looks like a scar tissue. It's really just dried cells. That's when you plant them again. So here, as the dry season is drawing to a close, we even have the hope of a few sprinkles next week, but I don't really believe them. Yeah. In any case, <laughs> you've got a couple of months, or I would say at least six weeks. This is the time to... Look at your succulents when they're crowded or you want to spread them around, you want to get more coverage. Dig them up, break them into pieces, lay them out, and then get them into the ground so that when the rainy season comes, they're ready to strike out heavily and grow from new roots. And um, then come March, they will be ready to take off. Yeah, I've seen the succulent growers, uh, a lot of times the, the leaves uh, will just break off or mm -hmm. they, they, they sort of just right. uh, fall all apart. And I, I saw that I thought it was so interesting. It was sort of a, a large plate or a tray, a really, flat, a flat, yeah, with with um, grab, almost gravel on it, mm -hmm. and all these little pieces were separated and mm -hmm. just set in, you know, in this area on top of the thing. I thought, oh, how very clever, because each one of those little leaves is going to produce a little plant, mm -hmm. and that, and then as the plants get bigger, they they right. tr transplant. That's them a out. real strategy for succulents, and that's why succulents don't need to be watered all the time. Those juicy little leaves are full of water once they. Um, um, dry out at the edge, there's enough um, germplasm there to start a new plant without any water or soil. And it, they can go on for weeks or even months before they need to be potted. So the idea that plants need to be watered all the time, especially when transplanting, is definitely not true of mm -hmm. succulents. Yeah. They are adapted not to need it. Yeah. And um, also some tubers as well. If you're digging up if you're mm. digging up tubers, let them sit and dry out. Put them in some straw or some sawdust or something that just let them dry for right, a little bit. Right, exactly. Because raw, exposed wounds are really incubators for um, fungi and bacteria. So let them dry in the air and they will respond by rooting much more quickly. Any last comments, last words? I told you this. This show goes by so quickly. Well, um, my last words are hit the nurseries now. Um, they have a lot of stock that they might want to be selling. Um, some nurseries have great areas where things are a little bit shabby or past their prime, and you can get some really good discounts. And remember, gardening is year-round here. You don't have to wait till spring. Um, I would take those, those little orphan plants home, and uh, with a few simple steps, you can get them ready for the, for the wet season, and you'll have magnificent plants at a fraction of the price. So time to shop for plants. Well, thank you again, Martin, for being with us. And uh, that's it for another edition of In the Garden right here on KSQD in Santa Cruz. Thanks so much for being with us.